Okay, so again, I think this, uh, you know, we sort of gave you an overview of where things stand in 2017 for the management of patients who present with kidney cancer, both localized, locally advanced, and metastatic disease. And now we're going to sort, the, uh, sort of put those principles into practice with some case uh, presentations. Uh, first, if anyone has any questions about the lectures, uh, now would be a good time. If you had wanted to ask a question, feel free. And if you have any questions about the cases or want to get a better understanding of why they do what they do, uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt and, and ask a question. So gentlemen, these are the ground rules. You can mention clinical trials, but your ultimate recommendation should be the standard of care. No whining about the radiology. There are no tricks. Please tell us what you would do, not what you could do. Explain the reasoning behind your recommendation, and brevity is a must. No babbling. We have a lot of people to help here today. So the first patient is a 57-year-old African-American male who presents with a history of hepatitis C and a history of renal cysts. His doctor ordered imaging to follow up on this history of renal cysts. Again, his past medical history is significant for hepatitis C and uh, esophageal reflux. Previous surgeries include appendectomy and laminectomy, and his CT of the chest demonstrates small, basically indeterminate pulmonary nodules. And you can see he has this lesion present in his left, or sorry, his right kidney. So, let me go back here, hold on. So, uh, Serena, why don't you tell me what you see? Well, there appears to be, uh, there's a normal left kidney, uh, first of all, but on the right side there is a multi-cystic, sort of a complex, solid mass, upper pole of the kidney, based on what I can tell, maybe to the mid portion. Okay, so what's, uh, what's your differential in this? Um, not having seen anything else, uh, it could be cysts that have hemorrhaged. He's had a history of cysts by itself. It could be that it's a mass. Uh, so this, this area right here is, an, mm -hmm. is enhancing with the administration of contrast. You can okay. see the brightness there. Yeah. So, it's so a, let's assume that's a solid mass. Yep. So again, your differential diagnosis is what? Uh, well, I would be con with that. You're concerned about a renal cell carcinoma. Um, he's African American, so you always want to think about potential for medullary RCC and see if they have uh, sickle cell trait. And also I would think transitional cell carcinoma because it could be a dilated renal pelvis and could be sitting in the renal pelvis. And maybe. I haven't seen the other images. Sure. There are no other images. <laughs> All right. So we did cystoscopy with a retrograde pilogram which showed a UPJ obstruction, so an obstruction at the where the ureter joins the renal pelvis. Uh, and there was a mass extending from the atrophied renal parenchyma into the collecting system. We could not pass a ureteroscope because of the UPJ obstruction. Avoided urine cytology and washings of the ureter were negative. So what now? <coughs> Nizar, what are your thoughts? I think he most likely has a renal pelvis tumor. Okay. So uh, you need diagnosis. Not, it's good that he doesn't have metastatic disease. So um, I would biopsy uh, the mass, that solid area, that uh, if you are not able to get through it retrograde. So you do a needle biopsy the mass? Well, I, um, I let you or uh, Jose or Serena uh, handle it, but I think uh, he does have a mass that enhances, and there is obstruction, and uh, it is tumor, um, as far as I'm concerned. There is no metastasis, which is good. So that the only thing, you could proceed as is and do surgery uh, and not get a biopsy um, because he doesn't have metastatic disease. And he does have the indeterminate pulmonary nodules, which... But again, well, I think those, uh, they could be, they are indeterminate, so they may not be metastatic. JJ, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think we would do a biopsy. You know, so you do a biopsy? Yeah, try to okay, so you got one biopsy, we got Nazar, biopsy, Serena? I would do surgery, take it out, get a frozen section. Um, if it by chance is urothelial, then we'd get the rest of the ureter and the uh, bladder cuff at that time. It's an atrophied kidney, so I don't think you have anything to lose by doing that. Okay. And Eric, what, what about you? What do you think? Uh, so you said the urothelium, sorry, the, the urothelium was normal in the pelvis? 
No, you couldn't see inside the pelvis because yeah. of the UPJ obstruction. I do a biopsy. So, okay, so the medical oncologists want to do a biopsy and the surgeons want to do surgery. <laughs> Makes sense. So we did surgery and it turned out to be a T4 collecting duct carcinoma. It was invasive into the overlying peritoneum. Margins were negative. So Nazar, you're our guru on weird variants of kidney cancer. What are your thoughts about this? How would you manage this patient? He's at high risk for recurrence because of T4, and collecting duct carcinoma is a virulent disease. It's like RMC, and uh, obviously, because he's African-American, and the diagnosis histologically is, uh, 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 you know, collecting duct, I would get a hemoglobin electrophoresis or uh, a check, ask if he has history of sickle cell trait, as Serena mentioned, because he could have RMC instead of collecting duct. Although, for an adjuvant, I still, um, there is no data with high level of uh, evidence to strongly recommend any adjuvant therapy. Um, so would you recommend any adjuvant therapy? No. Okay. JJ, um, would you recommend adjuvant therapy? So this is, this is similar um, to bladder cancer. So uh, in bladder cancer, if we have T4 disease, we would, we would <coughs> offer adjuvant therapy uh, with chemotherapy. <coughs> so uh, I would favor adjuvant therapy. What therapy would you give them? Um, likely, you know, gem site being cis bladder. Gem cis, okay. Yeah. Serena, what are your thoughts? Um, no adjuvant. No adjuvant? Okay, Eric? Close surveillance. Oh, so I'm glad, we're, I'm glad we're all united in our opinions. Okay, so basically the patient was followed with close surveillance, and he was NED for five years, actually. And he moved to Korea, and he uh, basically got tired of flying back to the U.S. for his checkups, and he came back one last time in 2016. Again, his uh, CT chest demonstrated those indeterminate pulmonary nodules that had not changed, so they're likely benign. And um, JJ, tell me what you see. It, it looks like uh, in the re resection bed on the right side, there is a, a, a mass there. Okay. And what, what is that mass doing? So it has some contrast in it. Uh, it looks like uh, a tumor recurrence to me. Right. And it's... I'm basically trying to get you to say that it's invading into the vena cava and actually extending almost into the left renal vein over here. That's correct. And there's some nodules here and here that would suggest lymphadenopathy. <clears throat> so the patient now has a local, five years out from surgery, and I say that to you patients who after five years get tired of coming back for follow-up. Five years out from surgery now has a local recurrence invading the vena cava with lymphadenopathy. So very quickly down the line, how would we manage this? Dr. Gao? Uh, I would, you know, this is, although this is uh, apparent cancer recurrence, I would get a biopsy uh, for a couple of reasons. One is for definitive diagnosis. Two is I can, you know, send the tissues for a tumor pro a genomic profiling study to see whether there are targetable mutations in the future to, to direct um, both treatment and also clinical trials. Okay, so you do a biopsy followed by what? I would look at the biopsy first. Okay, and the biopsy comes back collecting duct. Now what? Uh, if it's collecting duct, um, so it looks like this is, you know, that the tumor invades into the inferior vena cava, so I would consult my uh, urology colleagues to see whether this is resect resectable. If it's not, we can offer uh, neoadjuvant treatment. Okay, Dr. Tanier, what would you do? I agree, I think if there is no evidence of metastasis and you think this is resectable, since it's been five years from the initial uh, nephrectomy, uh, and we know this is collecting duct, uh, it's not uh, anything that we know how to treat um, or there is eff effective th systemic therapy for it, I would do surgery, I would go and resect it. Okay, Dr. Mateen? Surgery. And Dr. Yonash? Surgery. Wow. We're united. Okay. So Not, we did take the can, patient for can surgery. I, I can ask for, a quick question. Yeah. So, Scan six months ago were? Negative. Oh. So the patient underwent exploratory laparotomy. He had resection of the mass with, with a uh, resection of the vena cava. RPL and D, we had to patch the uh, IVC with pericardium. 
and also we remove the adrenal. You can see the pathology there showed poorly differentiated carcinoma consistent with collecting duct. Margins are negative. Two out of nine lymph nodes are positive. The mass was six centimeters in size. Dr. Gao, what's next? I would, I would still favor, uh, favor uh, adjuvant therapy. So you'd favor adjuvant therapy with? Um, I mean, he has disease in the lymph nodes, so that means the future recurrence rate is almost 100%. So okay. I would give him chemotherapy uh, again with gemcitabine cis plant. Gem cis, okay. Yeah. Dr. Tanir? I would follow him, close surveillance. Close surveillance, Dr. Mateen? Yeah, I think JJ makes a really interesting point about these collecting duct tumors being what is thought to be you know, similar to urothelial. So, but uh, I think the current standard would be close surveillance, so. And Dr. Yonash? Surveillance. So one chemo, three watch. <coughs> okay. Well, ultimately we did watch this patient and he did recur in the supraclavicular lymph nodes and he was referred to Dr. Tanier for further systemic therapy and I guess currently is doing okay. Let's move on. So 51-year-old Jehovah's Witness presents with elevated LFTs, past surgical history unremarkable, past medical history is hypertension and cholesterol, labs are within normal limits, CT chest is negative. And just for the uninitiated, uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, people typically don't allow blood transfusions. They don't allow their blood to be outside of the body. It has to always be connected through some sort of circuit um, and uh, makes for some challenging <coughs> times during surgery. So Dr. Uh, Mateen, tell me what you see. So there appears to be a locally advanced tumor in the right kidney. I think there's a tumor thrombus also. Um, that kidney does not appear to be salvageable based on those images. On the left side, there is a exophytic tumor in the medial upper pole. Okay, so again, just to show the audience, there's a locally advanced tumor involving the right kidney with extension into the renal vein and into the IVC. There's a tumor thrombus right there. And then on the le left side, there's a tumor sticking out of the upper portion medially of the left kidney. So, um, Serena, give me some, give me your thoughts. How would you manage this patient? What would your counseling be? And, and, and how would you take this patient to the operating room? So between the two lesions, the right side is the one that's more immediately threatening, uh, both in terms of, you know, potential for progression locally and metastatic. Um, my experience with Jehovah's Witnesses is that they come in different flavors, so to speak. And sometimes they are very prone to societal pressures in terms of their own society. So I try to have a private conversation with them about how strict of a Jehovah's Witness they really are, because sometimes they will say if push comes to shove and it's life-threatening and they need blood, they'll actually will accept it mm -hmm. if they don't have that societal pressure uh, immediately next to them. So I think that's an important conversation to have. But either way, uh, surgery is really the primary, it's the only potential for cure. So we would talk to them about, about that. If they still don't accept blood transfusions, there are some measures we can take, including using a cell saver, uh, which means this blood we suction up remains in circuit and then get, get filtered and be given back to the patient. And there would be a high risk for needing blood transfusion with that right-sided procedure. So my recommendation ultimately would be, you know, taking all those steps ahead of time but doing a staged procedure with a right radical nephrectomy, IVC tumor thrombectomy, uh, see the patient back probably you know a month, maybe even at three months to restage them, and if there's no evidence of metastatic disease, uh, do a left partial nephrectomy. No role for doing both at the same time. Do not like to generally, uh, not unless the other side is also highly threatening. I think the the risk of renal failure is very high in those cases. Okay. Anyone have any different thoughts about that? Is there anything in that liver there? Is, you know, there is a little. No. So her LFT is elevated because of the tumor in the kidney. So basically. Uh, yeah. Probably they're elevated because of the anti cholesterol drug, but in any event. Anybody have any different thoughts about this? Nope. So right side first, which we did. Uh, we used Cell Saver. We had 100 cc blood loss. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then in, in delayed fashion, we did a left partial nephrectomy, 50 cc blood loss. Cell saver was used both times. 
Any role for adjuvant therapy in this patient? Is there any medicine that we can give him to decrease his risk of recurrence? I'm assuming by silence that means no? No, no. no. I mean, <laughs> un yeah, unless the trial. She, he, can, he or she can participate in the trial. Clinical trial, okay. Which can be a, which can be a challenge as well. Right. It can be what, I'm sorry? A challenge, challenge. as well, as right. well because, because of, of Jehovah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Would anyone have considered neoadjuvant therapy to try and shrink the tumor and make the surgery easier? No, I would not. Serena? Um, no, I don't think so, no. Okay. All right, let's move on. Who, 91? 91-year-old. African-American gentleman presents with lower urinary tract symptoms and dysuria. Past history of hypertension, a remote history of seizures. Uh, you can see the medicines he's taking. Good performance status. He's young, he's younger, looks much younger than his stated age. EGFR of 70, so that's the, his, basically his kidney function is, is good for someone 91 years of age. CT chest is negative. And you can see he's got this rather large cyst in the left kidney that does not enhance. There's also a hyperdense cyst, which is a cyst filled with protein or old blood that does not enhance. And then he's got this lesion present in the lower portion of his uh, right kidney. You can see it a little bit better here. Again, very large cyst present in the, uh, in the left kidney. So. 91-year-old uh, guy, looks younger than his stated age, got a mass in the lower pole of his right kidney and a huge cyst in the left kidney. Who wants to take this on? Nazar, what would you do? 9 to 1, I think uh, I would uh, observe. You'd observe him. Any role for biopsy? Biopsy, if you're going to do something, you know, uh, if you're not going to operate on a 91-year-old, you, you could observe him for a short time and see if this grows, increases in size. What, what is the estimation of the size of this? Four centimeters. Four. It's, it's, the size is a borderline where you consider small renal mass, and management of a small renal mass, even in younger people, includes active surveillance, and uh, if you want to do a biopsy, you could do biopsy and do it, you know, ablation, or you can do partial nephrectomy. But somebody who is 91, um, I think any of those interventions uh, are not without their complications, and I'm not sure this is going to uh, increase his survival. So you would like observe? Uh, and, uh, yeah, four centimeter I would observe. How often would you get scans? You know, six months. Every twice six a year. months? Okay. JJ, what are your thoughts? Uh, what is the cause for the dysuria? Is it caused by the upstream masses, or this is just, you know, infection or anything? No, it's just he's got a big prostate. Okay. Yeah, in that case, I would agree with Snizar. Um, you know, at age 91, if you do anything, you potentially can cause more harm than benefit. So you would observe? Right. Okay. Dr. Mateen? Yeah, when I was a fellow at the Cleveland Clinic, we actually looked at the issue of age, um, and <clears throat> we used a large database, and basically the only thing that age predicted by itself was a longer hospital stay. Uh, and that's probably related to support, uh, their ability to get support at home. Uh, well, the, the, the issue with being older is that it, you, the older you get, the more comorbidities or coexistent medical conditions you have. <coughs> and it, what really determines the likelihood of complications are the comorbidities, not age. Uh, and actually, there's been several other studies and other specialties that have looked at this and with the same conclusions. So I think the issue of physiologic age is important, mm -hmm. and, um, and this patient physiologically probably is younger, uh, better kidney function than I have. Um, and with a four centimeter tumor, I would actually give him the option of definitive treatment with either like a robotic partial or possibly biopsy followed by ablation. Um, if by chance he wasn't interested in surgery, then I would at least try to do a biopsy before making a determination. It's fairly hypervascular, uh, heterogeneous in its appearance, so I would be concerned about a clear cell, um, possibly a clear cell type, which okay. would be more aggressive. So. so he says, whatever you say, doc, that's what, that's what I'll do. Yeah, I would offer him treatment. So you'd offer him treatment, and that treatment would be? Partial. Partial nephrectomy, okay, Eric? I'd do differential renal function to see how much the left contributes. I would uh, offer him uh, a biopsy, perhaps, to confirm what this is, and think about, perhaps, thermal ablation. Uh, versus partial 
um, you know, if this guy, uh, the alternative would be to, a short, to do a short interval follow-up imaging study to see whether this thing's changing at any reasonable rate uh, of growth. And, and that would also partly define whether or not this, you know, the aggressivity, you could do a short interval follow-up scan, and if the thing t doesn't budge, then, then that would actually decrease the risk of this actually being something, uh, something dangerous. So what would you do? I would do differential renal function, and I would suggest to him that we would intervene. Okay. So we did do a biopsy, uh, and the biopsy came back as clear cell kidney cancer, four centimeter mass. Again, does that change anyone's mind? Dr. Gao, does that change your mind? Still want to watch it? Um, well, of course, you know, I will have a very candid discussion with him. Um, you know, patient pre preference, especially at his age, is very important. You know, some people will say, um, I don't want to do anything. So if it's up to me, uh, you know, if I were at his age, I probably will still I will be leaning toward doing nothing at this time, except you know getting close imaging at this time, maybe in three months instead of in six months, to see how fast this tumor grows. All right. This so in three months, the tumor hasn't changed. What are you going to do? I would continue to observe. Every three months. Yep. So basically, you're treating the tumor with radiation from CAT scans. <laughs> well, the CAT scan radiation is not that high. You can, I mean, after two or three. CT scans, if everything is stable, then you can, you know, you can expand to every six months instead of every three months. All right, Dr. Tunier, does this change anything in your thoughts? No, but obviously, I mean, uh, we live in a society where patients uh, make a decision as well. So if the patient wants uh, intervention, then obviously the, uh, what Serena mentioned, uh, now that we know it is clear cell, not say oncocytoma or some other benign etiology, then the option would be uh, partial or ablation, and both intervention modalities are appropriate. So it's the patient will drive the decision. If the patient, as JJ mentioned, uh, does not want to uh, be, uh, you know, operate on or have any procedure, I think it's, it's reasonable to follow them. Uh, you know, 91, again, even if we did surgery, are we increasing up substantially the survival. Uh, I don't know if we intervene, are we going to make him live to be 100? Uh, I don't know. So uh, that's why I think I'm fine with observation if it's okay with the patient and the family. He says whatever you want to do. So you'd observe? I would observe. Okay, so Ernie, you already told me you'd take it out? Well, I think, you know, percutaneous ablation is not unreasonable either. The thing is with that size and the fact that they looked a bit central, mm -hmm. uh, the results with that are not quite as good. Um, but I think it's still a reasonable option. Um, the only thing, and I think, you know, Eric made some good points. The only thing about a nuclear renogram is with a distorted kidney like what you have on the left side, the reading can be very skewed. So I would, it's, it's not a bad option, uh, but uh, you just have to look at the results with a grain of salt. Eric, does this change your mind? Nope. So you'd still observe, or you no, do no. some? You do some? No, I'd want to. I'd want to remain. Okay. Because you know, 91. When we're 91, we're going to probably think differently about being 91. That's true. Um, my only issue with ablation here is that with these lower pole tumors that are you know medial, is ureteral injury. Yeah. You know, because the ablation zone has to go out beyond the confines of the tumor, and and sitting right here next to the tumor, is the ureter. Sometimes you can put up a catheter and irrigate cold saline to prevent it from getting injured, but I've had a couple of patients that have had ureteral injuries as a consequence of getting ablated in the lower, with a lower pole tumor. But anyway, what we did was we did do a partial nephrectomy. What I did note was that even though the guy was younger than his stated age, his kidney was definitely 91 years old. Tissue was very, very friable, very difficult to sew, but ultimately we were successful. It was a T1B grade three, and he had a post-operative urine leak that was managed conservatively and ultimately resolved. Okay, let's move so, on. Can you give us a follow-up? Is he still alive? Yes. How many? How old is he now? I think he's like 93 or 94. Thanks me every time he comes to the clinic for saving his life. Uh. <laughs> well, I mean, but, but we of have course. to. There is obviously you're showing success story. If he had uh, some complication, not that you have ever have had any complications, it would not be me. different discussion. That's true. 
but that's, I mean, he actually was very pro. Do something. Do no, something no, obviously. Different. I mean, it's a posi- like I said, the decisions are driven by patients. If he wanted intervention, you would intervene. But well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I agree complete with that. I mean, certainly you take the patient's wishes into consideration, but you don't offer them something that's not indicated just because they want it, right? All right, so 43-year-old white male with uh, right flank pain and, he- and gross hematuria or blood in the urine. Also has fatigue and weight loss. No significant past medical or surgical history. Chest CT shows bilateral pulmonary nodules. Bone scan and MRI of the brain are negative. Got some anemia, low blood count. LDH is normal. Calcium is normal. Platelets and, and white blood cell count are normal. So you can see here the, is the lung CT. Here's a nodule right here in the left lung. Here's a rather large nodule here in the right lung, also a nodule here. A couple of nodules here. And then he's got this locally advanced tumor involving his uh, right kidney with extension into the renal pelvis. You can see again, this is another picture of it here, locally advanced tumor. So let's start with Eric. How would you manage this patient? I would do biopsy and I would send him to JJ's uh, trial to do uh, if it's clear cell. So biopsy to demonstrate clear cell and you put him on a clinical trial and if you were practicing out in the community, how would you treat him? Probably send him for nephrectomy probably, uh, let's see, it's a bit of a weird looking mass, so I would probably still biopsy it first, because I want to I want to exclude some sort of a variant histology. And if the biopsy showed, let's say, clear cell, you'd send him for surgery? The surgery, yeah, surgery first, cytoreductive nephrectomy followed by systemic therapy. Suppose it showed papillary. Um, I would then have a conversation with the patient and say, we're. it's not as clear whether the nephrectomy would prolong survival, and we could initiate systemic therapy first, because it's not a particularly large renal mass. Okay. And if it were clear cell, you did the biopsy, they had their surgery, uh, what systemic therapy would you offer them? Well, if it's in the community, the standards of care would be sunitinib or pizopinib as a front line set, in the front line setting. Okay. Uh, Serena, what are your thoughts? I think clinical trial is a, always a good option to offer. We do have one that regardless of histology, uh, he'd be a candidate for, which is the uh, cryoablation or the tremi limumab with or without uh, cryo. Could you just, just briefly describe the theory behind that trial? Yeah, so basically we have this clinical trial. It's actually a pilot trial because it's never been done in the setting of kidney cancer. But the idea here is to, uh, to patients like this who have a metastasis that we can ablate do, or do percutaneous cryoablation. Um, we do the percutaneous cryoablation and then follow it up with uh, immunotherapy, checkpoint blockade. The idea there is, and it's based on several lines of uh, research that have been done, when we do cryoablation, we're basically revving up the immune system. Um, but, and then with the addition of the immune checkpoint blockade, you're essentially releasing the brakes on that immune system. So the idea is to really rev up the body's ability to fight the cancer. So we're testing that with this uh, clinical trial. Okay. And um, she, he has uh, one of the smaller, the smaller metastasis in the lung is amenable, I think, to cryo. Um, and the good thing about that trial is that it's two months of treatment, and then they still go to surgery for cytoreductive nephrectomy, which I think the patient, whatever they do, they should have that done at some point. So. Okay, Nizar. Yeah, I like the idea of a biopsy. If it's clear cell enrollment on check on the trial. JJ is leading the uh, 2013 0715, which is uh, randomization to one of three arms, either nivolumab alone or nivolumab plus bevacizumab or nivolumab plus ipilimumab, as he showed. If it is uh, a variant histology, since he has flank pain and gross hematuria, I would not treat him with systemic therapy. I would send him to you or or Serena to do the surgery. Um, and then post-operatively we'll treat him with systemic therapy. And what would that be? I mean, if he's papillary, we have a trial that's uh, coming up. Uh, uh, It's an international study with savolitinib, uh, a cement inhibitor, pure cement inhibitor versus sunitinib. So I encourage him to enroll on a clinical trial because there's really no established therapy for variant histologies RCC. And if you were in the community, what would you offer? Sunitinib. Okay. How about IL-2? Well, I'm talking about non-clear cell. Okay. Uh, Hydrozal 2 is not a therapy for non-clear cell. So I, I'm s- sorry. So if it's clear cell, if we it's do clear, a nephrectomy, if, if it, would you no, offer a mild 2 
Yes, he, yeah. since he's 43, obviously, yeah. If, if he doesn't have access to enrolling on the trial of JJ, the, the one with the immune checkpoint inhibitor pre-surgery, you know, before the nephrectomy, then we'll do the nephrectomy and then post-operatively after recovery, he'll, I can discuss with him, I'll discuss with him high dose L2. Okay. And Nazar, just out of curiosity, what do you tell patients that the mortality rate is associated with high dose L2? Close to 0% now. Okay. In the past, it used to be up to 4%. But now it's close to 0%. We have not lost any patient uh, in more than uh, 12, 13 years. OK. JJ, any different thoughts? Yeah. Um, apparently, he's very young. Um, so despite the fact there is lots of enthusiasm about target therapy, immune checkpoint therapy, we cannot forget about high-dose IO-2 because uh, if you treat 100 patients, six or seven of them can be cured. So that's actually a very high percentage, especially in younger patients with younger children. So w I will definitely talk to him about that. And uh, it appears, you know, if he has good organ function, uh, that would be something to consider. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, all the other therapies discussed by Nizar, Serena, and Eric will be, will be good as well. Okay, so just to summarize, in the community, uh, probably upfront nephrectomy, plus or minus a biopsy beforehand, followed by sunitinib or pizopinib. Here, here at MD Anderson, we also have the luxury of several clinical trials that potentially could be offered to this patient. So he underwent cytoreductive nephrectomy. It was clear cell with focal rhabdoid differentiation. Uh, he shows modest progression on postoperative films. What would you do now? Um, Nazar, you want to comment on rhabdoid? What does that mean? Now, all this means is that it's a high-grade disease doesn't mean uh, anything. It's focal, so it doesn't really change. It's still clear cell, so it's the most common histology. Since uh, you elected to do upfront cytoreductive nephrectomy, and he has, uh, you know, as anticipated, some progression uh, in the lungs, I believe. So if his performance status is still good, I would offer him high dose IL-2, because we're talking about, uh, you know, in the community now, or at MD Anderson. Now, if, um, he declines to have high dose IL-2, or uh, then I think you know he can be treated in the community. Let's say he wants to go back home and be treated locally, doesn't want participation in a clinical trial. Then I think sunitinib or pazopinib will be options. Which one would you choose? I think uh, sunitinib two weeks, one week off, uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, or pazopinib. I th you know look at uh, the other things if he. W there are some patients where I would choose maybe uh, sunitinib over pazopinib, and there will be some patients where I would choose pazopinib over sunitinib. Without going into the details right now, I think we can discuss that later. Later when? I mean, in, with the patient, and look at uh, the list of meds he's on, and uh, I think, uh, you know, it will be some nuances that uh, can be, that can sway one person, one, uh, one drug or the other. Okay. JJ? Um, yeah, I mean, other than what uh, Nizar talked about, um, if he has measurable tumors, he can be um, he can be a good candidate for clinical trials as well. Okay, let's move on. So, uh, part of my geriatric practice, 82-year-old physics professor, presents with right flank pain and gross hematuria. He's got some medical problems, hypertension, coronary artery disease, carotid stenosis, hypercholesterolemia, aortic stenosis, hypothyroidism, and complete heart block with a, a left bundle branch block. He has a pacemaker. He uh, takes aspirin and some other medications. CT of the chest is negative. So to move along here, this, he's got a locally advanced tumor involving his right kidney. Here you can see it in cross section. So 82 years old, multiple medical problems, has a pacemaker. How would you manage this? Let's start off with Eric. I would uh, get him off his uh, anticoagulants for a moment and do a biopsy to figure out what this thing is because it's, very, it's a rather unusual looking tumor. So you'd get him off his anticoagulation and biopsy, okay. Uh, Dr. Mateen? There's chest imaging is negative. Negative. I'd get him medically cleared and do a nephrectomy. Do a nephrectomy, would you do it open, lap? You know, I, it's a little hard to tell. Like, it doesn't look like it's invading the bowel at all because there's not much of a plane visible there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would look at that. 
Uh, but it's not, it's not invading the bone. Yeah, so I would do it laparoscopically. Laparoscopic nephrectomy, okay. Would you do a node dissection? Uh, again, can't tell what's above the vena cava there. Um, Nothing. Yeah, if I don't see anything abnormal, no, I wouldn't do it. Okay. Dr. Tanier, thoughts? Yeah, nephrectomy. Nephrectomy, okay. Um, would you do it open or lap? <laughs> I'll send him to you. Let you decide. <laughs> Fair enough. Dr. Gao? Yeah, well, he has pain. Apparently, the tumor is ca causing symptoms and also hematuria. So, surgery will solve both problems. So, I would okay. go for surgery. So, we got one biopsy and three surgeries. Patient underwent radical nephrectomy with RPLND. He had uh, T3A disease with invasion into the renal vein as well as into the sinus fat. Uh, we recommended surveillance post-op, and he was uh, without evidence of disease for two years. His CT of the chest remains negative, but two years out from surgery, he comes in, and he has this. Adrenal. And you can see it here, too. So, Dr. Mateen, what are your thoughts? Uh, did you save the adrenal? You preserved the adrenal at the time of surgery? We did. Yeah. You so, we did what? You saved it? We left the adrenal in place. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, he, I'm guessing it's a adrenal metastasis presenting two years later. Okay. What do you want to do? If he has no other evidence of metastatic disease, I would do surgery. I'd do a laparoscopic adrenalectomy. Laparoscopic adrenalectomy after a laparoscopic nephrectomy? Yeah, I've done several of them. Okay. Would you approach it transabdominally or, re or go through the uh, retroperitoneal approach? Um, you go trans. There's really, uh, at that point, the retroperitoneum is obliterated. Mm -hmm. So you go trans. Okay. Anyone have any other ideas? Would anyone do a biopsy? No. Adrenalectomy. Adrenalectomy. Dr. Gao? Uh, I agree. You agree? Okay. Yeah. Dr. Jonas? I'd also uh, have a conversation with my interventional radiologist to see whether or not this could be thermally ablated. Thermal ablation versus, okay, but everyone agrees it needs to go. Any role for systemic therapy, either before or after surgery? No. No. Mm -mm. None. Okay. So he had a right radical adrenalectomy, which showed metastatic renal cell carcinoma. What now? Surveillance. 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 How often would you surveil him? Four to six months. Every four to six months. Everyone agree with that? Yes. Yep. Okay. He was surveilled over time, and then he comes back eight months later. CT scan of the chest again remains negative. Dr. Mateen, what do you see? Um, looks like he's got a contralateral adrenal metastasis there. So he's got a lesion present in the left adrenal gland. Yeah. All right, let's go down the line. Dr. Gao, how would you manage this? Um, he's now like 83 or 84. He has done quite well with the previous surgery, so... How do you know? Well, apparently... <laughs> he's in good hands. Yeah. <laughs> I think you guys uh, did a good job on him. No so sucking up. If, it, if something worked for him quite well before, so I would still do the same thing. So you'd offer him surgery? Yep. Okay, and then he'd have to be on lifelong adrenal replacement? Yes. Okay, which is what? Uh, you know... The adrenal corticoid hormones. So prednisone and florina. Right. Okay. Dr. Tinier? Yes. I think the third is the charm. Hopefully this is the third and the last surgery he'll have. Yes. Um, left adrenalectomy and hydrocortisone, 20 milligram in the morning, 10 milligram in the afternoon. Okay. Dr. Mateen? You know, I may be overthinking this a little bit, um, but just to look at the timeline of things, it took two years for his first met, took eight months for the second met, and I do get a little bit concerned. The one issue with doing an adrenalectomy now and, uh, you know, with the age going on steroid replacements, it's not terrible, it's not great, but you are burning a bridge in the sense that if this is by chance an acceleration of his disease, uh, he really won't be eligible for clinical trials um, once he's uh, adrenally dependent. Usually, no, no, he will be, he will be. Usually not. No, no, he is. If he it would, is uh, physiologic replacement, yeah. he is okay. eligible. All right, so that's are, new, so that's been yeah, accounted yeah. for. Yes, if that's the case, then I think adrenalectomy would be reasonable. So you do adrenalectomy? But I, yeah, but I would be, I am a little bit concerned about acceleration of his disease. Okay. Open or laparoscopic? Laparoscopic. Okay. Dr. Jonas? I would once again consult my interventional radiology colleagues. Mm -hmm. And they say no. Then I would have it surgically removed. So you do an adrenalectomy? Yeah. 
Okay, so he underwent a left radical adrenalectomy, uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma. There are actually two tumors in the adrenal. So what's next? Surveillance. Surveillance, everyone agrees? No role for adjuvant therapy? Nope. No. Nope. Okay. So just to give you a follow-up on that one, on that uh, case, he ultimately developed lung metastases, and I think T Dr. Tanier is treating him now. Okay. Um, okay. So 44-year-old white male with a history of renal cell carcinoma presents with abdominal pain. He had a previous right radical nephrectomy back in 2003. There's his pathology. Then he had a hand-assisted laparoscopic left partial nephrectomy in 2008 for a T1A tumor. He's got some minor medical comorbidities. These are the medicines he's taking. Again, those dreaded bilateral indeterminate pulmonary nodules. Brain and bone scan are negative. He's got some renal insufficiency with an EGFR of 42. So just to help, with, help the crowd understand, so he's got, here's his kidney. And there's a tumor involving the upper pole of the, of the left kidney with extension into the renal vein and into the vena cava. That's also shown here. Here's another view. Again, locally advanced tumor involving the left kidney, very central, extending into the renal vein and ultimately into the vena cava. So this guy's got troubles. Dr. Uh, Yonesh, how would you approach this patient? Central lesion. I would biopsy it. So you'd biopsy this kidney? Okay. And the differential you're looking for is what? Uh, TCC versus yet more RCC. And I'd also do a good family history, figure out why this person, who, so he was 20-something or 30-something when he had his first renal cell carcinoma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just sort of, I would, I would also just make sure we, we figure out whether or not he has a syndrome or not. Okay. So you'd look for genetic syndromes and you'd do a biopsy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mateen, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's recurrent RCC. Um, and I'd need to look at some more images. Uh, usually in these cases, you have to do a radical nephrectomy. You could consider systemic therapy to try to downsize it. Um, Does that work you, in your experience? What's that? Does that work in your no, experience? No, not great, not reliably. The other thing we've done, uh, not many patients, in fact, I have a fellow looking at uh, our experience here, but I have done partial nephrectomy with tumor thrombectomy when the anatomy looks favorable to do that. Uh, you know, exceedingly rare indication for it, but uh, as long as you think that there is some venous anatomy that you can preserve or do venous reconstruction, which we have not yet had to do, um, then uh, you could potentially do that. Okay. But I have no. I have, can't tell. I can't have tell. have to have more films. It's yeah. Not, it's not. It's yeah. not favorable? No. Doctor, uh, so again, tell me one more time, Serena, what would you do? Oh, uh, surgery and so dialysis. You, you'd uh, take it out and yeah. do dialysis, okay? Dr. Tanir, what are your thoughts? Unfortunately, yes, uh, that he will be doing dialysis, so surgery. Surgery. And Dr. Gao? Uh, I would like to uh, take a look at the tumor. Uh, like what Dr. Yonash said, I would like you know, to see what it is. So you do a biopsy? Yes. Okay. So the biopsy comes back as clear cell kidney cancer. What are you going to do now, Eric? I'll put him on exitinib. Put him on exitinib, okay. In the hopes of? The hopes of changing, hopefully qualitatively or quantitatively changing the surgical approach because data from Wood and Karam suggest that uh, significant shrinkage can occur with that agent. Okay, so you put him on exitinib, how long? I'd rescan him in three months. Three months, okay. Uh, JJ, clear cell. What are you going to do? Uh, I would put him on my trial. You put him on your trial? Yeah. So, a little bit of self promotion there? It's okay. Well, it's a. <laughs> There's no metastatic disease. So, originally the plan was for him to go on JJ's trial, actually. Okay. He had a biopsy that showed clear cell renal cell carcinoma, but then after the biopsy, he went into renal failure. Uh, his creatinine rose to 3.5, his EGFR was down to 20, and he required dialysis. So at that point, we figured there was no point, like he wasn't eligible for the trial because of his renal failure, and we felt that there was no point in even attempting any nephron-sparing approaches, so we took him to the OR and did the radical nephrectomy, uh, and also placed a dialysis catheter. So um, just very quickly, JJ, any role for additional treatment after the nephrectomy? Uh, no. Okay. Anyone, well, let me put it this way, anyone want to give him additional treatment? No. Okay. No. And uh, Serena, 
in your experience, when would this patient be eligible for a renal transplant? He's got a lot of people, a lot of family that want to give him a kidney. Yeah, so generally, it depends on each transplant center because they have their own, all their own criteria. But generally, for a locally advanced tumor such as this, it's a five year wait. Uh, for low stage tumors, usually they'll wait one, maybe two years. Uh, but for something like this, I think uh, it would be a five year wait before he's eligible for transplantation. So five years, okay. Yeah. Um, just to give you a follow-up on this patient, actually, uh, this happened about two years ago, and uh, just recently he presented with a urethral metastasis, which was resected. Wow. And uh, currently he's NED. I think, it was a, I think it was probably a drop metastasis. Okay. Um, how are we doing? Doing well, okay. So 23-year-old African-American who presents with gross hematuria and flank pain, no previous past medical or surgical history. The pain was alleviated with uh, non-steroidals like Motrin. He uh, just graduated from Yale University with a degree in business. He's got some mild anemia, but otherwise his labs are within normal limits. They think it's a kidney stone, so they do a stone protocol CT, and he is told that it is negative. Um, Dr. Mateen, do you agree with that radiographic assessment? Well, you know, I mean, we're doing patient kidney cancer conference, so <laughs> either the right kidney appears somewhat more asymmetrical than the left side, but there's not much more you can say. All right, so what would you do? Contrast enhanced CT so or MRI. you'd get a contrast CT. For sure. Okay. And well, with a, with, uh, for the audience, with the gross hematoma, with visible blood in the urine, there's no question that a uh, enhanced uh, contrast enhanced studies indicated. That's that's standard. Yeah, I mean the message should be gross hematuria is cancer till proven otherwise, and you need yeah. to get an enhanced CT to be able to because that that right kidney does not look normal at all. There's some fullness here that is not you know if you look at the other kidney you don't see that you can see some fullness here. So they didn't do that, uh, and the pain persisted as did the intermittent gross hematuria. And he sought numerous medical consultations until someone had the bright idea of doing a sickle cell test, and he turned out to be sickle tra uh, cell trait positive. Five months after the initial presentation, somebody finally got a CT with IV contrast. CT of the chest, bone scan, and brain MRI are negative. So, Dr. Tanier, what do you see? I mean, he has a uh, centrally located right renal mass. He has bulky adenopathy uh, in the retroperitoneum, uh, retrocaval, intraortocaval. Um, this is renal medullary carcinoma. Is there any need for a biopsy? Sure, but uh, I think, yes, you need to do a biopsy, but an African-American uh, with sickle cell trait, a mass in the kidney, renal medullary carcinoma, uh, until proven otherwise. So it is, you would, you would get a renal biopsy, a renal mass biopsy, or a biopsy of one of those lymph nodes to confirm the diagnosis, because I think that could impact or influence the approach to treatment, whether we go with surgery up front, uh, radical nephrectomy, and retroperitoneal lymph node dissection with the resection of all visible disease, uh, and then adjuvant therapy post-surgery, or pre-surgical therapy followed by surgery if the patient responds to uh, therapy. And if it is real medullary carcinoma, which I suspect this patient has, when you do the biopsy, then I'll, in this patient with bulky nodes, um, I would do systemic therapy up front and then do the surgery. All right, so the biopsy does come back as renal medullary. What systemic therapy would you offer? The only therapy that so <coughs> far, uh, outside the context of a clinical trial, obviously, so in the community as well as at MD Anderson, unless we have a clinical trial for these patients, the therapy, the mainstay of therapy is cytotoxic chemotherapy and uh, paclitaxel plus carboplatin uh, or dose dense MVAC, any of those cytotoxic uh, chemotherapy regimens that we have, we treat our patients with, uh, produce a, uh, around 30% response rate. And it's the only thing that has really produced long-term, uh, uh, you know, survival in a very small fraction of the patients. Unfortunately, this is a disease, as I was saying in my, my uh, presentation, that uh, really needs, uh, requires uh, concerted uh, efforts to really uh, 
do research to try to really, um, you know, have insights, gain insights into the biology, and uh, identify some targets and uh, develop some effective therapies more than just what we do. So as you know, in our uh, paper that we published last year in British Journal of Urology, the median survival of patients with advanced RCC, which is this patient, uh, is 13 months. So this is a really a very, very aggressive cancer. 13% survive two years, and less than 5% survive five years. In fact, out of more than 50 patients uh, on, in that study, only two are now five years, uh, alive five years in ED, only two out of 52 patients. So that's less than 5%. Uh, so this is really a very aggressive disease, and I think we are uh, conducting, uh, in collaboration with you all, uh, uh, research uh, to really gain insights into the biology of this disease. And we have actually uh, two clinical trials. We have three clinical trials. We finished one with uh, an inhibitor of the EZH2 pathway, which is upregulated in this disease as a result of a gene, uh, uh, it's Mark B1 loss for this disease, which defines this disease. And we have a trial with uh, pembrolizumab, uh, a PD-1 antibody, uh, and a trial that we soon uh, uh, open in our uh, department, JG alluded to it, with nivolumab plus ipilimumab in this disease for renal medullary carcinoma. Okay, so again, the biopsy shows renal medullary. Anyone have anything different from Nazar? Anyone want to do upfront surgery? Take that as a no. Okay. So biopsy revealed renal medullary. You got five cycles of chemotherapy with paclitaxel and carpal platin. There's the response. You can see that the tumor in the kidney has regressed significantly, as has the retroperitoneal adenopathy. So what would you recommend, Eric? Surgery. Eric wants to do surgery. Okay. Serena? Surgery. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tunier? Of course, surgery. Okay. I'm not even going to ask you, JJ. <laughs> All right. So the patient underwent a right uh, radical nephrectomy with RPL and D. There was minimal residual tumor in the primary uh, and, and the nodes, so basically there was a significant amount of treatment effect. The patient did develop chylocystitis postoperatively. Dr. Mateen, I know you never have this problem, but uh, when you're managing my patients, how do you manage chylocystitis? Uh, I usually start with change in diet, a low fat or non fat diet. Uh, that doesn't work. TPN. Uh, somatostatin, you could try. I don't think it works great. It's super expensive, and patients have side effects, but those, those would be the three, three things we do. Okay. And of course, drainage. Dr. Uh, Yonesh, assuming postoperative studies are negative, what would you recommend at this point? Close observation. <laughs> Man, a few words. Dr. Uh, Tanir? I mean, that's, again, there is no data to guide us in a uh, high level way, but uh, my approach is because these patients, as I said, their survival is so poor, and this is an unusual, gr gratifying response. Since he had only five cycles, if he didn't really have a whole lot of toxicity from those five cycles, I would continue with what worked. And this is similar to the experience, say, with ovarian cancer. And, you know, I would keep giving him treatment until tolerance with the hope that he'll be one of those 5% who will survive five years. So I would give him more of the same chemo. Okay. And Dr. Guy, so are you shaking your head yes, you would too? No, I actually, I, uh, I agree with Dr. Tanir. So apparently he's, he responded very well to chemotherapy, but he still had some residual tumor, uh, which means it's possible that, uh, and also with the lymph nodes uh, that has treatment effects, that means inside the lymph nodes actually he already had tumor cells before chemotherapy and the surgery, uh, which also means he probably has microscopic disease in other parts of his body. So in that setting, um, Considering most of these patients don't survive beyond two years, so I, I would give adjuvant chemotherapy. Like so what would Dr. you give them the same said. stuff or different? Uh, same stuff. It, 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 you know, with five cycles of chemotherapy, there was dramatic reduction of tumor. That means this type of uh, chemotherapy actually worked very well. Uh, for the small residual tumor, it's probably just, you know, inside the tumor that the chemotherapy just didn't penetrate very well. Well, so to I would be devil's advocate, could you also, couldn't you also explain that as the residual tumor that was left was the resistant clones? Uh, it could be. But, you know, normally in our experience, if you, especially for bladder cancer, if you give four cycles of chemotherapy, very rarely you can, you can achieve complete response. So, um, 
so I would I would you know I would do the the same type of chemotherapy. It, if you switch to another chemotherapy regimen, that that's fine. Um, but in this setting, I will I will continue because it, he just had five cycles. If he okay. had six or seven cycles, I would switch to something else. Okay, we have we have time for one more case, I think. So, 57-year-old African-American female presents with abdominal pain. Uh, history of hypertension. She also had an MI back in 2012, myocardial a heart attack. Um, these are the medications she's taking. CT chest is negative. Labs are within normal limits. Everyone gets to be a surgeon today. So here's her scans. You can see there's a tumor here in the right kidney. It's largely inside the kidney. And then another tumor here in the left kidney. Another view. So um, let me see if I have another one. So what would you recommend? So let me go back. Doctor, uh, st start off with uh, Dr. Gao. How would you treat this patient? Um, Don't say send to us. It looks like you already oh. gave the answer. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, well, but anyway, how would you how would you manage it? <laughs> yeah, it's not the answer. It's what happened. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm always curious about what's what's going on there. So, uh, um, as a medical oncologist, I think uh, we always. Not always, but I, I, I favor a biopsy first. So you do a biopsy. Okay, yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Tanir, what would you do? Two partials. Two partials. Which one first? The right. You do the right side first? I mean, I, which is the easiest of the two? Um, the left. The left? Okay. The left is easiest. So maybe do the left then. Uh, to make so sure that if I'm going to end up with right radical refractory, I have at least a remnant of the left. So she don't, the patient doesn't end up on dialysis. So if, it's, if you say the, the, the easier of the two is to do the left, I'll do the left first. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Dr. Mateen, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I would do the I would do staged bilateral robotic partial nephrectomy, do the left side first. It, it's not easy on the left side. Um, it goes all the way to the vein, actually, in the deep portion. But it's easier than the right side. Also note that they have two different characteristics on scan, so which there may be two might be, it's possible, and you certainly see that, not that it would change management, but it's just an Any interesting role for observation. Um, no, I don't think so. She's got some comorbidities, but I think she, you know, she's a surgical candidate. I would, she was about 91. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Jonas? Yeah, I wouldn't do anything different. In, th in this case, actually, these are, I think, typical looking enough that I would want to, I would forego a biopsy, and I would recommend, I would send into my surgical colleagues. Okay, so as you are well aware from me flipping the slide the wrong way, she actually went to an outside hospital, did not come to MD Anderson, and she was counseled to undergo a robotic-assisted laparoscopic left partial nephrectomy, the quote-unquote easy side, and this would be followed by an attempted robotic partial on the right. Per her surgeon, the left tumor was found to be, quote, more complex, end quote, and they actually took nine hours to do the surgery. With, with the robot. Pathology revealed unclassified renal cell carcinoma, and all of the margins were positive. Basically, they just hacked through tumor to get this thing out. And after the case was over and she'd recovered, she was advised to have a period of observation for the right-sided tumor, which by definition was the harder side. So the patient wasn't happy with that. So she comes to MD Anderson for second opinion regarding management about four months after her left-sided surgery. There's no interval change in her medical condition, and her scans, CT chest is, norm, is uh, negative, and labs are within normal limits. So, uh, Dr. Mateen, what do you see? There appears to be a little bit of progression in the right-sided tumor, um, and uh, that you can see that on the panel to the right or to the left. And then on the other panel, there may be some local progression within the central portion of the left kidney, maybe. There's a lot of post-operative changes, too, in fat stranding, which is hard to discern this what about, early What about on. this right here? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. There appears to be something central. That's a, actually a urine leak. Oh, it's yeah. It's a contained urine leak. Yeah, no big deal. So what would you do? Um, I would... There's another view? Yeah. Is there... Is there recurrence in the left side, centrally, or is, is that there? just kidney? What's that? I don't know. Is there? 
I, I don't know. Um, and if that's the best we can tell, I would actually proceed with a right partial. So you um, would proceed with a right partial? I would, because it, it appears to be progressing. I am concerned about her recurrence risk on the left side. Mm -hmm. With unclassified RCC, uh, she also has a metastatic risk. Okay. I don't think we can quantify it. But, uh, you know, I am really concerned about the fact that ultimately she may be looking at the right side being her only kidney. So I'd want to salvage that now while it's still as easy as it could be. Okay. And would you do it robotically or open? Um, you know, uh, I, my gut instinct initially was to do it robotically. We can do more complex tumors like this. But with someone who presents like this, um, you know, that could be the planetary cycles telling you something bad. So I would actually consider an open one, too. So what would you do? Open. You'd do it open, okay. Yeah. Dr. Yonash, how would you manage this patient? No, I agree with uh, Serena. I'm really worried about that, um, that the left kidney. I've, I've had some individuals where, you know, you have these, uh, these less classified or higher grade tumors where you <coughs> have an incomplete partial and then you have an explosion on that side. So trying to get this right-sided lesion that's increasing in size out of the way hopefully can set the stage for some sort of a completion resection to the left. And what would trigger you to do a completion resection on the left? Um, see, that's the thing. Uh, I, would, I would do very, at this point in time, I think I would do very close surveillance, <coughs> hoping that if you do see bona fide progression in that side, that, that you're not losing a window of opportunity. Okay. I would have a discussion with the patient. I think we'd have to do the fir right first, see what the renal function is, and then have a conversation about maybe doing that preemptively. Okay. So what we ended up doing was we did a right radical, oh, sorry, that's a different case. What we ended up doing was <coughs> we did the right partial nephrectomy, did it open, and we're just observing the left side for What's evidence of recurrence. Side, side. What was the side? Just unclassified on both sides. Both sides unclassified. Both sides were unclassified. <laughs> and, you know, my thought process behind that is, you know, even though the margins were positive and she's at big risk for recurrence in that kidney, Hacking through the tumor doesn't change the stage or the biology of the tumor. And so if it's still a stage one tumor, it's going to behave like a stage one tumor. So I think the risk is relatively low regarding losing track of it and having metastatic progression. But it certainly could recur so locally. do you have a follow-up on her after the... So far, NED. NED, how many years from the first partial on the left? I think it's like about a couple of years. A couple of years yeah. from the left partial? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think but Chris makes a good point. You know, the, the one thing we have to keep in mind with positive margins is, you know, everybody gets very anxious and concerned when you first hear about it. But especially for a stage one tumor, the real risk is not when everybody's all excited about it. The real risk is when you start forgetting about it. <laughs> Meaning that if you look at the re recurrence risk in those with positive margins, it occurs three to seven years after, which is just when everybody starts getting tired of all the follow-up and you start letting your guard down. Mm -hmm. So that's what I emphasize to patients when I tell them is I know you're anxious and very concerned, uh, but the real thing to think about is you know, three, five, seven years potentially afterward when, you know, the, uh, that, that's the behavior of these. It's, it's much more indolent than that. And so you have to reset your brain a little bit in terms of that anxiety and concern, both, so do, both as a physician and the patient. So, so do you continue with imaging studies for surveillance for past five years? Yeah. You would? Yeah. Like every year or past five years, once a year? Pretty or? much. Yeah, but the, the, I think the thing to do is to temper it initially. You get a baseline study, uh, make sure it's okay. Uh, you follow them a little bit more closely, but not as, uh, you know, not as uh, anxiously as some people do where they're scanning patients like every three months. <laughs> because again, in the first two or three years, that, that, that is not the behavior of these. Uh, so that it's, it's, the idea is to not be unreasonably aggressive initially, but then to uh, continue keeping your sort of radar signal higher for longer than you normally would. So Serena and Chris, wouldn't one of the other things you worry about with this nine-hour surgery be that there may have been tumor spillage? And absolutely. That, well, that's, the, what, and that's the, what we're... And so the nature, of, the nature of the recurrence might actually be outside the kidney itself, which yeah. sort of maybe partly taking back what I said before about the, the completion of rectomy, that, that may not actually take care of that problem in of itself. So, so you, yes. you have to sort of game what, what kind of recurrence this patient's gonna have. No, yep. that's correct, and I mean, I, but, but real quick, but that's why we don't jump in and do it for that, I think you said it really well, because you don't know what you're 
if what you're taking out is where did this potential <coughs> microscopic disease is located or not. Because the last thing you want to do is subject them to what's going to be very difficult surgery, and then years later they have a recurrence right outside that area that you did surgery. So in many ways you have to let the disease declare itself and then uh, does, that, does that verbalize sort Agreed. of our, our mm -hmm. strategy? Just add uh, also, yeah. Yes, we are concerned when there is, uh, you know, so, quote unquote, surgical mishap. Uh, you know, uh, since two years now passed and she hasn't had any recurrence, it's unlikely there was spillage in the abdominal cavity. Because usually, my experience at least has been that those patients who had surgical mishaps, rupture, you know, some mishandling of the tumor intraoperatively, they recurred within the first year, in fact, the first six, nine months with abdominal carcinomatosis. So yes, she, st she may still be at recurrence, and I agree with her, you know, five, six, seven years you need to follow them, but it's unlikely that she's gonna come with this abdominal carcinomatosis or ascites uh, in the future if it hasn't happened by now. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I've seen lower, lower grade tumors where you end up getting these slow growth of, of nodules kind of in and around the, uh, the, the, prior, the partial nephrectomy. So I think it's a question of how aggressive, if it's a, I agree with you completely, if this is a high grade tumor that has this inherent uh, properties, that's when you get that, yeah. that pasting of disease in the peritoneum. But with the lower grade uh, tumors, you'll, you'll end up getting these slowly growing nodules that are perinephric. Okay, and I think with that, we'll adjourn. I wanna thank you all for coming. It's been our pleasure. Uh, thank my esteemed panel. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you again same time next year. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much.